Welcome. We're getting ready to begin the workshop called What Can We Learn from Beethoven's Deafness by Robin Wallace. I fell in love with this speaker. <laughs> Gosh, when did I fall in love with him? This is recorded. Well, I know this. We were friends online and a group of friends, and I noticed what an amazing writer he is, what a devoted father and family man he is. And while he was still married to Barbara, what a devoted and caring and loving and supportive husband he is. Of course, it was a while later before Robin and I met in person and got married. <laughs> but uh, I just want to give a shout out to my, to my husband and my partner in life and express my gratitude to him before I introduce him formally. OK. <laughs> um, Robin Wallace is professor of musicology at Baylor University. He is the author of Hearing Beethoven, a story of musical loss and discovery in which he examines Beethoven's deafness through the lens of his experience with his late wife, Barbara, who was deaf during the last part of her life. He, was publish he has published extensively on Beethoven's music. Let's welcome Robin Wallace. Thank you, Meg. That was uh, an experience I have never had before and may never have again. Uh, so uh, let me start off by saying uh, that uh, I am a white man of indeterminate age with blonde hair and I'm wearing a light blue shirt and uh, gray pants. And uh, although you probably won't be able to see this, I am wearing hearing aids and will shortly put on reading glasses so that I can read this talk to you. Uh, from that, you can probably deduce that this will be a somewhat more formal talk than most of what I have seen at this conference so far. Um, I initially wrote this talk. Can everybody hear me OK? Uh, Uh, I initially wrote this talk for the uh, convention that met here of the Society for Christian Scholarship in Music. Uh, so it was for an audience of scholars who were Christian, but uh, not necessarily knowledgeable about uh, disabled uh, disability issues. Uh, I have uh, done some revision uh, in order to uh, reflect this audience, uh, but uh, there are uh, maybe some material that you're already familiar with, but uh, this book was written as a, or a talk was written as a follow-up to my book, Hearing Beethoven, uh, which is for sale out in the narthex if you're interested in uh, acquiring a copy. Um, and uh, it uh, was originally titled Healing Beethoven, question mark. Uh, oh, the slide up on the screen is a black and white sketch uh, which shows a uh, robed and bearded man, presumably Jesus, uh, reaching out and taking the hands of a reclining woman. We're all familiar with the biblical stories of healing. They can be found throughout both the New and the Old Testaments, and although they are most often associated with Jesus, he is hardly the only biblical figure to have performed miraculous cures. In one scene after another, serious and stigmatizing conditions like leprosy, blindness, paralysis, and demonic possession are healed miraculously and, it often seems, effortlessly. There is a sketch by Rembrandt of Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law that captures the human dimension of these stories particularly well. In it, the personal and physical interaction is palpable. Both the bodies and the gaze align to form an image of empathy, compassion, and human community. Jesus is clearly reaching out to the sick woman and welcoming her back to health. 
and by his posture, he conveys that he is also willing to reach out to her at her own level, unafraid of the social barriers such an act might transgress. Now let me tell another story. When my late wife Barbara passed away in 2011, after eight and a half years of profound deafness, one person in my church told me that her first thought on hearing the news was, now she can hear again. I couldn't help wondering if there was a different way to think about things. Imagine heaven as a place where being deaf would not be the profound handicap it is on earth because everyone else there would know exactly how to accommodate a deaf person's needs. Being in a wheelchair would not be a problem either because every destination would be fully accessible and no one would do anything to make the person in the wheelchair feel different or needy. Conditions like autism or cognitive disability would not cause anyone to miss out because these conditions would be accepted as part of the full range of being human. God's presence in and with every single person would be deeply felt. I am not trying to set up an either or view of the issues involved. I do not doubt that God provides healing on a daily basis and that many experience it. I have experienced it myself. I am also deeply aware, though, that many pray for healing and do not receive it, and that many with disabilities resent the widespread societal assumption that they should want to be cured. These facts pose significant theological challenges that need to be squarely addressed. I will be focusing on Beethoven, who lived at a time when the societal framework for understanding disability was shifting, much as it is today. As Joseph Strauss recounts in his book, Extraordinary Measures, throughout much of history, disability was seen as a trial for which the disabled person would be rewarded in the next life. Around the time of Beethoven, this view began to re be replaced by a new medical model in which the goal was to cure or overcome the disability. It is hardly a coincidence that Beethoven has come to be seen as a classic example of the medical model as applied to deafness. Although medical interventions did not provide him much help, some of his best known compositions, such as the Fifth and Ninth Symphonies, can seem to trace a personal story of overcoming adversity. The widespread acceptance of this view, I believe, has limited our understanding of Beethoven's life and work, a subject to which I will return. Of course, many who study disability have now moved past the medical model, but I fear that it can sometimes be replaced by a different kind of rigidity. I personally experienced this when my late wife, Barbara, who suddenly and completely lost her hearing in her mid-40s, received a cochlear implant. It was around this time that Joe Strauss, my former classmate at Yale, called for an organizational meeting of a disability studies group at the 2004 American Musicological Society meeting uh, in Seattle. I attended hoping to talk about my experience with Barbara and to connect with others who had experience with hearing loss. To my dismay, I found that for people in the meeting, cochlear implants were anathema. To many in disability studies, in fact, they were downright evil. Both the field of disability studies and I would have some growing to do before we could begin to reconcile these differences. My experience in Seattle showed disability studies, I believe, in its purity phase, a stage characteristic of many new movements with high ideals, including, of course, those with religious aims. In a purity culture, dissent is not allowed. The goal is to adhere to a rigid agenda of redemption that leaves no room for grace or paradox. It would take more than a decade before the Music and Disability Group began to incorporate people like my friend Jeanette Jones, whose deaf son communicates by American Sign Language and also has a cochlear implant, which allows him to hear music and speech. The fact that people like him are now accepted by the deaf community is an indication that that community too has changed. The paradox of a deaf signer who can also hear when he chooses to shows the kind of comfort with ambiguity that also marks mature theology. When divine and human nature, body and spirit, grace and goodness can be seen not as opposites but as complementary aspects of a truth that cannot be explained in words, then dogmas like the incarnation and the virgin birth can challenge but not confound us. So it is, I will suggest, with our theological understanding of disability. <laughs> 
As Bethany McKenney Fox notes in her book, Disability and the Way of Jesus, the healing stories in the Bible have at least two dimensions. On the one hand, the healings resemble medical interventions, although nothing like modern technological medicine is involved. On the other hand, as the Rembrandt sketch illustrates, the stories are accounts of personal interaction. Without exception, they involve an encounter between a healer and another person, and the people involved bring different needs and perspectives to the table. As Jean Vanier wrote in Community and Growth, Jesus sent his disciples into the world so that they would have an experience of life flowing out from them, an experience of giving life to people, and an experience of their own beauty and capacities if they followed him and let his power act in and through them. From his experience working with cognitively disabled people at Loche, Vanier learned that, that healing flows both ways and that human community is enhanced when we embrace those who are marginalized, even if their underlying condition does not change. The idea that the non-disabled members of L'Arche have something to offer to the others was quickly replaced by the understanding that everyone in the community is equally valued and has a unique gift to share. In musical terms, this suggests that we should not wonder how Beethoven overcame his deafness, Ray Charles his blindness, Schumann his madness, or indeed how any other great artist with a disability manages to thrive in spite of it. Rather, foremost in our minds as we approach their story should be the question of what they uniquely have to offer. The idea that Beethoven was a better composer because he was deaf seems counterintuitive, but it meshes well with biblical narratives in which powerful insights are given to those seemingly less likely to receive them. Um, this next slide uh, is a uh, picture of uh, two men, uh, one on the left, uh, uh, presumably Moses uh, reaching out to uh, another person on uh, the right, who is uh, presumably uh, his brother Aaron. Uh, Moses, we are told, could barely speak, but was chosen by God to lead his people, a role usually seen as requiring eloquence. Arnold Schoenberg's opera, Moses and Aaron, focuses on the paradox that God's chosen prophet is unable to communicate successfully with his people, while the attempt by the more articulate Aaron to interpret his insights ends up distorting them. Uh, this next side, slide shows a whole bunch of people um, and uh, with uh, many different costumes and faces and complexions. Um, I have attended services at Living Water Community Church, a remarkable multilingual Mennonite congregation in Chicago, where the sermon is followed by an open mic session during which any congregant may go forward to share reflections on the sermon with translation if needed. And they do, including those who are not gifted speakers because precedent has established that their voices are welcome. The result is a more rounded, more complete understanding of God's word than is commonly found in churches at which only highly educated people are encouraged to speak before the congregation. Beethoven, of course, was musically articulate, but his failing hearing might have been expected to marginalize him in other ways. How could music by a deaf musician not be regarded as suspect rather than becoming the acknowledged center of the Western classical canon? the standard by which other composers are judged. The usual answer to that question, which is reflected, uh, both reflected and intensely critiqued in much of what has been written about Beethoven, is that Beethoven used his music to tell a story of overcoming adversity. Medical interventions could not heal his deafness, but Beethoven is often said to have performed a kind of spiritual intervention. Through sheer force of will, he mustered the power of music to tell a story of overcoming. According to this account, Beethoven found a kind of musical heaven in which he could hear again and miraculously brought that heaven to earth in one powerful, inspiring composition after another. Uh, and this next slide shows a well-known portrait of Beethoven uh, standing in front of a greatly magnified musical score, which is presumably one of his manuscripts. The consequences of this idea for our understanding of music are impossible to overestimate. As I argue when I lecture about Beethoven to undergraduates, the implications of the heroic view pervade our musical world today, and not just the world of classical music. 
When I ask my students what they think of the assertion that music is a universal language, the majority of them invariably agree. Moments later, they also agree with the statement that music is a form of personal expression. When I ask them how both of these statements can be true, if music is universal, how personal can it be? If it is personal, how can it be universal as well? They appear perplexed. I proceed to demonstrate that music is actually less able than the other arts to transcend cultural boundaries, and that personal expression is only one of many functions it has held throughout history. I then circle back to Beethoven and point out that his more heroic works, like the Eroica Symphony and many other pieces written during his middle years, have encouraged many of us to think otherwise. By using relatively commonplace thematic material and subjecting it to epic journeys, and the classic example here would be the bop, 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 bop at the opening of the Fifth Symphony, uh, and then at many other places in the Fifth Symphony as well. Subjecting it to epic journeys during which it grows in power and resonance before our ears, Beethoven encourages listeners to hear a personal journey of self-discovery in his music, while realizing that others will hear the same thing as well, music being universal, of course. But to sit in an audience listening to the conclusion of the Fifth Symphony is to experience a collective affirmation that is, that is deeply personal. Not only did Beethoven triumph over adversity, it appears, but we can as well. Because it has been affirmed by so much of the reception history of Beethoven's music, this story of overcoming is a historically valid reading of that music. I even go so far as to tell students that Beethoven communicated the same message as Walt Whitman did in Song of Myself, that personal experience is a broad enough yardstick with which to measure and understand all that it means to be human. Music's power to convey this viscerally and irresistibly is a large part of what makes it, in E.T.A. Hoffman's famous words, the most romantic of all the arts. I do not in any way mean to undermine the significance of this part of Beethoven's achievement. It is a healing story for the ages, but it is not the whole story. In fact, from the point of view of present-day disability advocacy, it is highly problematic. The reality is that stories of healing from severe disabilities like deafness, blindness, and paralysis are rare. Um, this next slide is a picture of my late wife, Barbara, uh, and uh, on her right ear are the uh, visible components of the cochlear implant. Barbara had two cochlear implants, but this did not change the fact that she was deaf. When she took off the receivers at night, she still couldn't hear, and we knew that the implants could fail at any time. It was possible to pretend that she had recovered from, or it was impossible to pretend that she had recovered from her deafness. Indeed, like other hard of hearing people, even with the implants, she struggled to communicate in everyday situations that others would not think twice about. The heroic accounting of Beethoven's creative life, on the other hand, pushes a narrative of recovery, casting Beethoven himself in the role of doctor. He healed himself, achieving astonishing success in spite of his deafness. But Beethoven's extraordinary success marginalized other voices by raising the bar to seemingly unattainable heights. This was exactly the dilemma faced by most composers of the next few generations who tended to suffer from what I have described as the Beethoven complex, seeking either to outdo Beethoven by writing bigger and louder pieces or to avoid the genres in which he made his mark. By this reading, Mahler's lengthy and powerful symphonies and Schubert's brief songs for voice and piano are both products of composers who were intimidated by Beethoven and the expectations he had set. One of the most striking examples I have encountered of this phenomenon was in a radio interview about 15 years ago with the producer of a new album by the band R.E.M. Asked if the then new trend of downloading individual songs would soon spell the demise of the album as a marketing concept, he responded that he didn't think so, since the greatest composers had always found it more worthwhile to write one hour long symphony than to write 23 minute minuets. That has certainly been true since Beethoven, I thought. Before, I'm not so sure. 
In my book, Hearing Beethoven, which is based on my experiences with Barbara and my lifelong study of Beethoven's music, I sought to establish a more humane way of understanding the composer's response to his deafness. From the time Barbara completely lost her hearing in 2003, I had had the opportunity to observe the limited benefit she received from medical interventions, most notably the cochlear implants, first in her left ear and then in her right. These were not miraculous cures. The sounds she received over the implant were pale reflections of what she remembered. They were particularly inadequate when it came to understanding in music. music. In fact, what was miraculous was that she was able to hear any music at all given that there is no apparent reason why the implant's 16 channels should have allowed her to hear more than that number of discrete pitches. The thing that made deafness particularly challenging for Barbara, though, was not the inadequacy of medical interventions. It was, rather, the apparent inability of other people to adjust to her limitations. This wasn't easy for them to do, of course. I struggled daily to adjust my expectations and to find ways to make it easier for us to converse. Public situations were particularly challenging since multiple people at once would have to change their normal conversational style in order to allow Barbara to hear. This was never successful for more than a few minutes at a time. Church was also frustrating. I worked hard to persuade our congregation to install a state-of-the-art sound system that would have benefited not only Barbara, but the large number of older members with limited hearing. Other priorities always got in the way. For Barbara and others who are hard of hearing, though, the relatively small amount of money needed for such interventions at church and elsewhere would be much more likely to yield satisfactory results and a far larger amount invested in the elusive hope of a cure. Uh, this is a picture of a large Gothic church with stained glass windows. The same kind of challenges and worse are regularly faced at church by people with autism and other conditions that make it difficult for them to fit in. A few years ago, much attention was generated by a letter posted on Facebook by Paul B. Rimmer and addressed to the Reverend Stephen Curry, Dean of the Chapel at King's College, Cambridge. I would like to apologize for bringing my autistic son to Evensong at your chapel, Rimmer wrote. Tristan is nine years old and is a clever and joyful child who loves church buildings, services, and choral music. He is also nonverbal and expresses his excitement by calling out and laughing. His expressions are often loud and uncontainable. It is part of who he is, so there is no realistic way for him to be quiet. Right before the Kyrie, one of the ushers informed me that you had instructed him to remove us. Tristan's expressions were apparently interfering with the enjoyment of some of the other visitors, which was very inconsiderate on our part, because tourists come from all over the world to hear Evensong. The usher seemed embarrassed but insistent as he asked us to leave, though I'm not sure if it was because of my son's vocalizations or because of the nature of the directive you had given him. As a Christian, I'm still quoting Rimmer here, I believe that worship is primarily intended to glorify God and may have misinterpreted your Evensong as an actual worship service at which my son's expressions must surely be pleasing to God, the experience of other worshipers being secondary. Our removal makes more sense if King's College Evensong was simply a concert held in a building that used to be a chapel. Might I suggest that you place a sign at the front of the chapel clearly identifying which categories of people are welcome and which are not. I can only imagine how terrible it would be if autistic people, others with disabilities, those with mental illnesses and people with dementia were all equally welcome to attend Evensong. How this would get in the way of the choir's performance, how it would distract the choristers, and how upsetting seeing these sorts of people at the chapel would be for the tourists who have come such a long way. Unquote. Appropriately, the dean of the, ch the chapel was mortified and responded with profuse apologies. The story, though, is retold countless times. Whenever a deaf person is reluctant to go to church for fear of feeling excluded, or a person with a physical disability stays home because their attendance would place too much of a burden on others. Perhaps less obviously, whenever one of the healing stories is read from the pulpit, some disabled people hold their breath to see whether it will be interpreted in a way that stigmatizes them. 
They may find themselves sitting through sermons in which they are chided for their lack of faith or told that conditions like theirs are a judgment from God. Clearly, a less black and white understanding of the nature of disability and healing would benefit both them and the church. Such an understanding might begin with a more nuanced understanding of what disabled people like Beethoven have accomplished. In hearing Beethoven, I argued that deafness shaped Beethoven's music in ways that are central to his widely recognized personal style. In terms of Beethoven's influence on later music, the most significant of these is his use of short, highly recognizable, frequently repeated motives. Again, pa 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 is perhaps the most famous example of that. Uh, and of course, I just sang the opening of the symphony, but by the time the symphony is over, you have heard that hundreds of times. While observing how Barbara learned to hear again after receiving a cochlear implant, I noted that small definable units of sound were much easier for her to process than longer, less predictable ones. She was frequently unable to recognize a sound until she was able to identify it consciously. At that point, it would click and begin to sound like what she remembered. And I've taken down the slideshow here so that I can play you a couple of short audio examples. Uh, the first one is a simulation of what a human voice sounds like over a cochlear implant. Okay, I didn't get any sound. The second example uh, is someone speaking what was actually said in that recording. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. Okay, now I'm going to go back and play the first one again. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. <laughs> and what you perhaps noticed is that when you know what you're going to hear, your brain makes you hear it. That was an important lesson that I learned. Um, so this observation that a sound that was recognizable would make more of an impression was particularly true of music. A piece she recognized would begin to sound right as soon as she recognized what it was. A short, highly recognizable melody was relatively easy for her to identify. In the book, I recount an instance in which she was delighted to recognize that our daughter Jennifer was playing Offenbach's Can Can in the next room. And that's the familiar melody that goes bum 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 So a very short, catchy, uh, easy to remember tune that clicked as soon as Barbara knew what it was. Like the Can Can, Beethoven's melodic building blocks tend to be short and memorable. The worse his hearing got, the more he depended on frequent, almost obsessive repetition of such material. It is as though he composed with the specific quality, specific challenges of hearing loss in mind. The rhythmic quality of his writing can even be seen in his sketches, like this one for the Seventh Symphony. And I'm going to put up the slide. Okay, this, this slide is a little bit hard to describe. Uh, it shows a uh, uh, piece of music, a manuscript paper, uh, on which uh, Beethoven has written extensively, uh, but in what appears to be a, a rather messy and incoherent manner. You can stare at this for a long time uh, and not quite be able to figure out what he was writing, but what you will notice uh, is that there are certain patterns that repeat over and over again that are visually appealing uh, as well as potentially being orally appealing. So you can see the rhythmic quality of Beethoven's writing if you look carefully at this sketch. Now, let me play you a passage from the Seventh Symphony, which is the piece that he was making this sketch for, uh, and you will be able to hear the same quality in the music, the same basic bump, 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 b
Yes, okay, the people online may not be able to hear this music example, um, but, uh, uh, but this will be recorded and you can go back and watch it later. Was that the? It should work on the video later. That passage that you just heard with the incessantly repeating rhythm, the powerfully building dynamics, is epitomizes what a lot of people mean when they talk about the Beethoven style. The result was a powerful musical style that can seem to tell a story of overcoming adversity. There are no more slides, by the way. But Beethoven also used short motives repeatedly in non-heroic works like the Archduke Trio, the Piano Sonata Opus 54, and even some of the Bagatelles for piano, which are short enough not to require motivic development. Still, what we call Beethoven's heroic style, the central style of his middle period, was indeed a by byproduct of his frequently repeated motives, which were themselves, I believe, a byproduct of his deafness. Paradoxically, the emphasis on that heroic style in Beethoven reception has obscured what I believe is a more important way in which Beethoven can be said to have healed himself in his music. Or perhaps I should say the way in which Beethoven used music to open himself to healing. As I write in hearing Beethoven, difficulty hearing and composing music was not the most devastating effect of hearing loss for Beethoven. In fact, by making small adjustments beginning in his 20s, he was able to hear music adequately for far longer than is generally recognized. The more immediate crisis he faced had to do with social isolation and depression, which were the conditions he focused on in an anguished letter he wrote to his brothers, the Heiligenstadt Testament of 1802. The impending loss of his most valuable professional asset created a spiritual crisis alongside the more obvious musical one. In response, I suggest Beethoven brought healing to himself by broadening his music's emotional range and dynamism. Heroic affirmation was only one of the many moods he showed music to be capable of expressing. In the works of his middle years, not to mention those of his final decade, he also thoroughly explored tragic anger, mystical relaxation, capricious frivolity, and effortless transition between these and other emotional states too numerous and varied to be described in words. The result was a dawning awareness of music's full expressive potential, 
an awareness that enabled the coming century of romantic music and that in many ways is still with us today. But it also marked a spiritual awakening on Beethoven's part. He deepened and enriched his emotional life and in so doing enriched ours as well. He may not have recovered from his depression, it haunted him at intervals throughout his life, but that in a way is beside the point. Like deafness, depression can be a chronic condition that is never cured. Beethoven showed that it is possible to live gracefully with both. This is a far more meaningful legacy than the beguiling notion that these and other adversities and disabilities can be overcome. To conclude, a series of recent experiments brings the problems involved in treating disability into sharp relief. Scientists have been working with several years with mice who carry a dominant gene that causes them to go deaf by the age of six months, roughly equivalent to the mid-20s in human terms. Through genetic engineering, researchers have had considerable success in preventing this from happening. Not surprisingly, these experimental subjects have come to be known as Beethoven mice. It's not clear whether Beethoven's deafness had a genetic component, but the goal of the experiment is to help people who are genetically programmed to go deaf in early adulthood by altering their genes so they retain normal hearing instead. So let us suppose for a moment that Beethoven's deafness was genetic and that modern medicine could have stopped or reversed it. The ethical issues are multifaceted. I have suggested today that many of the features of Beethoven's music that have made it powerful and influential, its emotional range, its careful construction, its defining use of motivic development stem from his deafness, the resulting spiritual crisis, and his efforts to accommodate both. Other less obvious features, such as his close physical connection to the instruments he worked on worked with and his reliance on the tactile and visual feedback provided by extensive sketching and revision can be traced to his deafness as well. And there's a great deal about that in my book. Uh, if Beethoven had not been deaf, he would have written different music. It would no doubt have been good music, but it might not have caused him to be remembered as the most famous and influential composer in history. Perhaps Beethoven would have lived a happier life and would not have been so isolated socially, a circumstance that we know caused him great pain. Would or should we go back in history and make Beethoven a happier but less important and influential composer? The question is rhetorical, of course, but the issues it raises aren't. Most of us would probably agree that if we could alter a gene that causes deafness, let alone a life-threatening condition like Huntington's disease, we should at least be able to choose to do so. But as Jean Vanier knew, our humanity is nourished by diversity, by encountering people with experiences different from our own, and by seeing value in those whom others often write off as ill or incompetent. If all disability were magically cured, would the result be a heaven in which people like my late wife could hear again? Or would it be a world made poorer for the loss of their voices? My intention is not to resolve such paradoxes, but to raise them. In the tension of these contradictions, I believe we can find both God and the freedom to think for ourselves about what is most important and most deeply human. And for that, I am grateful. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, thank you, Robin, for your uh, talk today about uh, Beethoven. My question is just um, um, something I could could simply look up. But if you could, uh, how, at what time, at what age did Beethoven become deaf? Uh, it actually took place over a matter of decades. Um, I believe he first he got his first signs of. Uh, begin of uh, incipient hearing loss at about 25 or 26. Um, my own suspicion, uh, based on uh, observing Barbara deal with 
uh, gradual hearing loss before she suddenly became completely deaf, uh, based on my own experience being convinced that I needed to get hearing aids, uh, is that he probably was losing his hearing for several years before that and only, uh, only acknowledged it at the point when it was impossible to ignore anymore. So that already happened by the time he was 26. Uh, it wasn't until he was in his late 40s that he became profoundly deaf and could no longer perform in public uh, or hear any music. Although uh, there is evidence that he still had a tiny amount of residual hearing uh, up until almost the very end of his life. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, for that really wonderful paper. I was very uh, pleased to see your citation of uh, Joe Strauss's important work mm -hmm. um, in contributing to uh, an entire uh, academic uh, and scholarly apparatus around disability in music. And um, it made me very happy to imagine that you and Joe are friends, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a gift that uh, this conference has brought me. But um, I wanted to ask if you, uh, in maybe not in this paper, but in some ways, might uh, engage with the concept of deaf gain, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if that might be a helpful uh, concept in balancing in your really interesting analysis the um, uh, the losses and gains, if you will, that uh, are produced uh, in myriad lives, your wife's life mm -hmm. and yours and Beethoven's life. Um, and if that uh, concept might be helpful to you. Yes, uh, thank you for bringing up that question. The, the term deaf gain is one that has been widely used in the deaf community uh, to replace the perhaps unfortunate term hearing loss, uh, which of, of course implies a loss of something that can't be restored. Thinking of it instead as gain uh, invites uh, people to think about the, the uh, additional things that one can gain from a deaf perspective. And uh, in, in musical terms, there has actually been uh, quite a lot of work recently on this. I would uh, particularly uh, mention the, uh, uh, the work of another friend of mine, Jessica Holmes, who has uh, written uh, extensively on music and deafness uh, and uh, uh, believes that, uh, that deafness offers a uh, unique perspective on musical experience that is, is often not available to others. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a complicated topic, but yes, that is, that's, that's, certainly a, a, that's certainly something worth exploring further. Um, Robin, I wonder if you would just, I think we have a few minutes, mm -hmm. um, what is in your book but not in this presentation is a little bit about the tools that he used, mm -hmm. um, his choice of pianos, the resonator. Yes. I wonder if you uh, would share just a little bit of that because it is quite fascinating. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so uh, when I visited the Beethoven house in Bonn uh, when I was writing my book, I had an opportunity to try out Beethoven's ear trumpets, which were something that I had read about all my life because every biography of Beethoven talks about the ear trumpets that he used. Uh, and the general tone of those biographies is to suggest that this was kind of a pitiful attempt by Beethoven to use a completely inadequate instrument to fool himself into thinking that he was hearing better than he was without it. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, so I was surprised and pleased to discover that uh, the, and apparently I was the first Beethoven scholar who had showed up at the Beethoven house and asked to put these things in my ear. Um, I was <laughs> pleased to discover that they were actually quite good uh, in terms of amplifying sound. They not only provided pretty significant, like, like uh, 
I, I'm at least 20 or 30 decibel amplification, uh, but they also did so uh, without much distortion and without amplifying background noise, which is one of the major problems with a lot of modern electronic hearing aids. Uh, so in many ways, the ear trumpets that Beethoven used for about a decade uh, were actually better than modern hearing aids. The, the one failing they had uh, was that it took both, at least one hand to hold them in place and with some of them both. Uh, so Beethoven could not have uh, uh, played the piano while using them, although he could listen to music with them. Uh, what um, he did uh, for the piano issue, uh, another thing that I had read in, in uh, many Beethoven biographies that was that in the last decade of his life, uh, Beethoven received uh, a gift of a uh, Broadwood pianoforte from London uh, and that he welcomed this instrument uh, because uh, presumably it was bigger and louder than the Viennese pianos that he had been used to playing on. Um, and that always seemed a bit paradoxical if he could barely hear at that point in his life, um, you know, what, how much advantage would he have gotten from a bigger and louder piano. Um, what uh, uh, we discovered, um, and I need to credit my friend Tom Began, who has, has done a lot of research on Beethoven's pianos. Uh, I also visited the uh, workshop of uh, uh, historical piano builder Chris Mana in Belgium. Uh, where he was working at reconstructing Beethoven's Broadwood piano, something that hadn't been done before, not the actual piano, but making a model of that piano to the exact specifications of the instrument, uh, but out of materials that exist today. So it presumably sounded and felt like Beethoven's Broadwood did when it was new. Um, and uh, we quickly confirmed that what really appealed to Beethoven about it was not the sound, but the, the, the strength of the vibration that the instrument conveyed, which was exponentially greater uh, than any of the Viennese pianos had. And it could even be felt through the floor when he was playing it. Um, and then another thing, and this isn't even in the standard Beethoven biographies because it was considered so obscure, uh, but there are some references in the conversation books, which are the books that uh, he carried around with him when he went outside of his house during his later years so that people could write down what they had to say to him. Uh, and there's a dialogue in there uh, about trying to uh, build what he called a Gehirmaschine, a hearing machine, um, which could be placed on top of his piano and would amplify the sound. Um, and uh, so the people in Belgium were also working at the time I visited at reconstructing Beethoven's hearing machine. It was essentially a wooden cupola that arched over the piano. Um, and uh, if you can imagine it on that piano over there, if I put the lid up, the piano, the lid of the piano would direct the sound out toward the audience, whereas the cupola directs the sound back toward the player. Um, and Beethoven apparently found this extremely valuable uh, because what little residual hearing he had uh, was able to pick up something uh, from that sound when projected back to him uh, in that way. I actually tried that instrument too with the hearing machine in place uh, and I even put on uh, noise blocking earmuffs uh, so that I could simulate Beethoven's experience um, and uh, again, it was a very full body experience sitting at the instrument and feeling the even stronger vibrations that got projected back toward me uh, and being able to feel them with your full body. And it, it gave me a, a, a very different perspective than I had had uh, on what Beethoven was doing at that time and why he continued working at that instrument even after he could barely hear. Yes, uh, there's a, if you're interested in this, uh, go to the website insidethehearingmachine.com, uh, which has all kinds of information about uh, this, uh, this reconstruction of the hearing machine, including a 50-minute documentary that, uh, that I and several other people appear in. Um, and there is also a recording that goes with it uh, of the last three Beethoven piano sonatas, which were the ones that he wrote uh, after he had the hearing machine in place. 
um, and uh, Tom Began recorded them um, using Beethoven's resonator. Um, so it's a bit of a paradox because you think, you know, you listen to this and you can hear what Beethoven heard, but of course Beethoven didn't hear it. At least he certainly didn't hear it the way that we hear it. But if you're interested in hearing what Beethoven would have heard uh, if he had played his, uh, his last sonatas on a piano with that hearing machine in place, uh, then I highly recommend that recording. Uh, and the lengthy program booklet that goes with it, which I also contributed to and which Meg edited. So we've got a little cottage industry here, I guess, at Beethoveniana. Um, uh, Robert, thank you for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I apologize if my question relates to something that you said the first minutes that I missed. Uh, but I wonder if I got the point correctly. You, it, it's, you seem to be saying that um, the point about your brain uh, kind of pushes your ears in the direction of what you already, already know. Mm -hmm. And that served, I think, if I got it right, as a kind of explanation why you find in much of Beethoven's work these repetitive uh, sequences of, of notes. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the case, uh, and I immediately <coughs> uh, uh, accept that that uh, that as a possibility. Would you not expect there be other musicians or composers in which you would find similar patterns? And if that's true or possible, do you know of any? Or is there any research done, for example, in the area of in in the area of pop music or or jazz or uh, uh, any other one? <coughs> Um, well, uh, the, the quick answer is yes, there, there are other such composers and, and because that was a side effect of Beethoven becoming as important and influential as he was, that many later composers imitated what he did, even though they might not have been motivated by the same reasons that he did. So uh, if you look at Brahms or Wagner, two later 19th century composers who are seemingly diametrically opposed to one another, they both took Beethoven's idea of motivic development and ran with it in different directions. Uh, Related to uh, known deafness of composers. Uh -huh. Uh, well, that, uh, that is uh, a subject that, uh, I'm, that anyone who wishes to would be welcome to, uh, to further delve into. Um, other composers who have experienced deafness uh, include uh, uh, Smetana, uh, who was deaf for about a decade before he died, uh, Fauré, uh, who uh, experienced uh, a very profound hearing loss in the last part of his life. Um, and uh, I have recently read Paul Simon, um, who recently came out with an album called Seven Psalms, uh, in which uh, he accompanies himself on the guitar uh, and uh, is also accompanied by a relatively small spare ensemble of instruments, including some resonant uh, uh, percussion instruments. Uh, and uh, I saw an interview recently in which he admitted that he may never perform live again uh, because he can't hear at this point well enough to, to synchronize with other performers. But I think that that album, which in many ways is almost Beethovenian, it has very limited musical scope, uses the same musical motives or, or material over and over again, uh, to the point where I, frankly, some people might find it boring. You know, if they're expecting Simon and Garfunkel, it's not gonna sound like that. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's and, and I didn't realize the first time I heard it that, uh, that Simon was uh, suffering from, from, uh, from partial deafness, but uh, in retrospect, it makes sense. Well, wonderful. Um, thanks so much for your enlightening talk, uh, Robin. Let's uh, give Robin a hand. Thank you. Mm -hmm.